I'm here with Tara Allison, known as Fat Girl Fit on social media. Tara has been crowned the internet queen of deadlifts, and she's a self-proclaimed big girl who lifts and an advocate for body positivity, self-love, and inclusive fitness. But Tara wasn't always this positive person with over 123,000 fans on TikTok that you see today. She experienced a lifetime of ups and downs in her weight loss journey to get there. And I'm super excited to have her share it all with us today. So Tara, welcome. Thank you so much. So glad to be here. I'm so excited to have you. Um, we had a great little like pre-production call uh, to like learn about your story and you, you just have like so much to share. So let's dive into it. And so normally I start out these conversations with asking people about like their aha moment that made them want to kind of like change their life and turn around. But I think for you, we should go back to the very beginning um, yeah. before that. So you mentioned to me that you sort of grew up in a family structure that had like dysfunctional relationships to food and health and fitness, um, and kind of like set you up for failure in the early days and ways. So tell me about that. Yeah. So I grew up in an amazing family. Like, let me start this and preface all of this with like, my family is wonderful. We all have a really great relationship. We're very close. My mother and I, despite all of the things that I'm going to say are super close. And, um, but it, we do have a family history of really dysfunctional relationships with food and exercise. Um, I think that it's multi-generational. Um, my mother grew up in a home with a mother who was overweight. I cannot remember a conversation with my grandmother that at some point didn't include things like don't get fat, it's horrible, or don't get fat, it's just a lifetime of misery. Like, she always said things like that that were just nuts. And we were always like, oh, grandma, whatever. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah. my response to growing up with an overweight parent who was perpetually unhappy um, was then herself to do everything in her ability to fight that, which meant uh, a lot of restricting behavior. So my mother um, has probably had a lifetime of disordered eating. Um, she controls food in a really unhealthy and meticulous way. And she did that for us as children. So nothing was allowed. Um, we ate primarily vegetarian. We ate, there were no such thing as like snacks for the most part. Um, I remember being small, uh, somewhere in the range of six years old uh, and sent to a birthday party with a note pinned to my shirt that said, no treats and only one slice of cake, please. Right. So there I was. A no. Small Oh, no. that, like the weird food stuff um kids would come over to my house to like swim in my pool I'm a Florida kid so we had a pool and um they were like the food at your house is weird <laughs> I'm like I know <laughs> so I always <laughs> had a weird relationship with with food my sister and I uh notoriously would sneak and eat things we weren't supposed to we once found like my mom's stash of like Halloween candy probably it was sometime in September where my mom bought things on like sale to mm -hmm. Google and amazing in that but um but definitely like we found the candy and like like we didn't even talk about it we just sat on the floor in my mom's walk-in closet and like ate it and then hid the evidence mm. and like spoke of it. it was this uns unspoken like like I'm not gonna tell if you're not gonna tell right. and so like a lifetime of that binging weird things like diet cookies I'd eat the entire box 
And then I'd like lie and say I didn't eat the entire box. And sometimes my dad, who never understood any of this, um, he'd like cover for us sometimes. He'd be like, oh, I took him to work, you know, like wink. <laughs> and, but like it, he was complicit in the weirdness and it just was. And it was always strange. Um, by the time I was in my early teens, I was being dropped off at a Weight Watchers meeting. Um, and I was not overweight. But those Weight Watchers meetings in the 90s um, were brutal. Um, that was a room full of women who hated themselves and hated their body. And I like have had the words of those women in my head for forever. Like I can hear those women still um, saying just the nastiest things about themselves. And we're talking about Weight Watchers meetings in the 90s where like you walked in and they literally weighed you in front of everyone, called out what you gained or lost. And I'm like 14, so I'm obviously gaining weight. It's like, I'm like mid to post pubescent, like, and was out in the world for the first time. I had gotten my first job. I was working in a restaurant. I was eating things I'd never eaten before. And the whole reason that I got dropped off at that Weight Watchers meeting is because my uniform pants were a little tight. And my mom was like, we're not buying more pants lose the weight but I my body was like changing and growing and I, yeah so yeah those were really miserable weird times and I really hated my physical self like I, I genuinely hated my body and as a result uh lacked confidence um and really self-esteem as well you know, and it just sort of affected everything. And, um, and it, it just never sort of changed. And it led to this lifetime of like weird relationships with food, uh, a degree of emotional eating, and this like perpetual self-loathing cycle that so many who really adhere to diet culture live within. Yeah, I, I really relate to this, um, like, you know, thankfully, I don't think I went through things as, as extreme as what you're describing, but definitely was raised in a household where my grandmother and my mother, both of whom I love very much. I'm super close with my mom, like same thing, great relationship, but, um, weird, weird food behavior, like constant obsession with not gaining weight and and aesthetics and wanting to look a certain way. And my mom is like, to this day, still like, I want to lose five pounds every day. Like she's never, never satisfied. And, um, you know, I was told like eating a banana was too many carbs. Cause it's a banana. As, you know what I mean? Like <laughs> just my mom's obsessed with fat, like the, yes. the idea that it's fattening, that's fattening or, or that's too much sugar. There's a lot of that's too much. It, the irony is that I, in my professional life, like that, like obsession with the lack of fat and sugar led me to be a pastry chef. And now I work exclusively in fat and sugar. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, it's super weird. It's a crazy thing. It's really weird. And it, it really does stick with you. That stuff is just so ingrained in your psyche for the rest oh. of your life, even as it you work to eliminate it. Rent free, no matter <laughs> how empowered, no matter how much self-love, no matter how good I feel, there are those small voices in the back of my head. And I can, I can always conjure them if I'm feeling unhealthy and need them. Like if, if I need to spiral down that, that rabbit hole, I can get there quickly with just a handful of phrases that live in my head and are so gross and so useless. And it's very sad. Yeah. And it's, it's sad that it takes us so much 
work to eliminate those thoughts and feelings, because like you said, they can pop up in a second and overtake your brain and all this work that you've done to like work on yourself and love yourself and forget that stuff that you just need 30 seconds and it comes back. And it's terrible that it's so hard to get rid of those thoughts. So how do you like avoid that now? I mean, you can never avoid it. Cause like we said, it's, it's part of us. Um, but you know, you've done so much work to move past this. And so What are some of the tactics that you use to quiet those voices when they do come back up? So first of all, I'm very conscious of them. Um, I am like almost hyper-conscious of them and I will hear them and feel them and then deny them. So sometimes that literally means saying And like, it sounds crazy, but sometimes out loud, I will say things like thunder thighs is a bullshit concept. (laughs) You know, like sometimes it's literally, and my husband's like, you said what? (laughs) (laughs) But sometimes I like literally have to be like, that's not real. That's made up nonsense from somebody else. Are you like talking to yourself in the room and your husband's sitting right there and you're saying these things? Like getting dressed and like feeling some kind of way or I'm, you know, I've had a stressful day and things have been hard and the voices start to creep in. And like, you know, that all sounds crazy, but like, you know, that like we exist with this internal dialogue or at least a, a certain percentage of us do. And I am one of those people who like have a constantly narrated internal dialogue that exists in my head. And as a result, sometimes it's like, (sighs) there's a woman who used to sit in that Weight Watchers meeting and she was, I think back and she's probably my age now, like she was probably in her late Mm thirties. And she, I remember her just saying like all the time, like, my body will never be good enough and she used to look at me and go like I don't even know why you're here god and I'd be like I don't really know either apparently I'm quite fat and like I you know I weighed like 130 pounds and um but like I hear her and I hear her saying your body will never be good enough that breaks my heart and, and I literally am like, that's not true. That's a lie. <laughs> and, and like, I have to change the internal dialogue. I also really, really talk to my followers, to my audience, a lot about self-talk. Listen, you may not be able to love your stomach. That may be a thing that you struggle with for forever, but... I am not the sum of my parts. And so I hyper-focus on the things I do love. I have gorgeous eyes and a bright smile. I have full breasts that are sexy and fun. You know, my butt is good. Um, I have cute little hands and feet and they keep me going in the world, both doing my work and enjoying my life. Like, I have to use those tools to remind myself that like, not all the things are great, but the things are great. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's a really solid way to find self-love and appreciation. Right. And you mentioned to me too, like you realized you had this really interesting perspective of you recognize the difference between that you didn't lack confidence at one point you're like I have confidence yeah I just don't have self-love and I have never heard someone break down that difference before so tell me more about that so I I am my mother's daughter and she raised strong confident women 
Um, we are just certain of who we are. And I know fundamentally at the end of the day that I'm good, I am worthy, I am kind, and, and that is all good. And so for the most part, with the exception of, you know, some of that stuff in my teenage years, as an adult woman, I have always been very confident, maybe a little too confident. <laughs> However, I hated myself on some level, always. And I started this fitness journey um, after, you know, every diet I've ever been on. I mean, like literally you name a diet I've been on it, but on this, like on this journey, which is very different than anything I'd ever done in the past. I early on came to a realization, um, after doing the stairs at the gym up and down, up and down, up and down until I felt like I couldn't do it anymore. And I was going to die. I sat on those stairs and I just began to bawl hysterically. And it was a realization that I didn't care for myself in any way. That I had existed in a world where I put my love, my care, my passion, my time into everyone else around me. And while I had confidence and existed in the world in a very confident way, that lack of self-love, that leads to a total lack of self-care was my destruction. It was the thing that would ultimately be my undoing. And so I sat on these stairs, bawling my eyes out, realizing that I've never once taken care of me. I never once put me first. I never even considered what I wanted, what I needed, or what was best for me because I existed in a thought pattern that made that selfish and um, unkind and inappropriate. I, for some reason, believed it to be inappropriate to consider myself first. And when I found my way to self-love, I realized that that is where self-care comes in. That if you care, if you love yourself, then you'll take care of yourself. Um, I often equate it to a car. I often say like, we've all had a crappy car, right? Everybody with few exceptions, we all universally have had a car that we didn't like. And you took no care of that car. You rode that thing until it nearly died. You often would go months and months over on oil changes. You never cleaned out that back seat. God knows what the smell in that trunk was. You didn't care. You just let it go. But then we also often have the experience of having like the car we always wanted or a car that's really nice and mm -hmm. that we really appreciated. And when you have that car, that car you love, you get her to the, to the uh, you know, to that oil change on time. You clean that thing once a week with few exceptions. You are concerned if there's a ding or a bump or a, you know, something doesn't sound right. And that's because you love it. Right. You don't love your body. You don't love this vessel that you exist in and appreciate it fully, then you can't take care of it. You just won't. Right. And, and it really, it makes all the difference. And so I really believe that change comes when we love and appreciate everything about who we are and we put the appropriate value on our existence. At the end of the day, this is the vessel I exist in today. Will it be the same in six months? I don't know. But I'm not going to concern myself with that. I'm instead going to focus on taking good care of it today and operating within those boundaries of self-love and self-care. 
I'm going to exercise that confidence by doing the best that I can for me. And that makes other people uncomfortable sometimes. You know, I often hear things like, well, aren't you self, uh, or aren't you, aren't you uh, conceited? I'll hear a lot of that. Aren't you conceited? Or, or don't you just think a lot of yourself? Or, ooh, you sure do think you're great for a fat girl. You know, I hear a lot of that. I don't hear any of that noise. It goes in one ear and out the other. Because at the end of the day, I waited like 37 years to give a damn. We like, only, that's so crazy. This once, you only get this once. How dare you decide that it doesn't matter? Right. Like, why would you do that to yourself? So I really genuinely believe in focusing on the things that we love about ourselves. And, you know, for some people, I find that it's simple things like, you know, Listen, especially with women, but also with men who are maybe overweight or, or uncomfortable in their body for whatever reason. It's little things. It's like, well, I really do love my hair. Awesome. I want you to tell yourself every day, I love my hair. It looks good. It feels good. It makes me feel good. I love this thing about me. And then you seek to find other things. And as you grow in just getting comfortable in that language, then it's about digging deeper. So like, I would have said to you two years ago that like, I hated my arms. Um, I know a lot of women are really uncomfortable with their arms. I love my arms. They're so strong they pick up so much weight and they make everything that I love to do possible. So I love them. Yeah. And it's, it's really about that practice that changes that practice changes everything. That is amazing. I'm just like so blown away by how you've been able to teach yourself these things, um, and like practice this one coach, uh, referred it as change talk where you like change the way that you you talk about yourself. It's so cool. Um, and so speaking of your like strong arms, lifting weights. So you, in addition to all of this work you've done on loving yourself, you have made like huge strides also in your physical fitness. So let's go back to the beginning again, a little bit. So what was your aha moment that made you want to make a change that led you to now being this pro weightlifter, I'm going to call you that so many people watch on TikTok. (laughs) That's crazy. Um, so, okay. I, um, Five years ago, I was getting married and I decided that I wanted to lose some weight just like every woman does because they decide they can't have their big day without in the body they're in, which is nonsense, girls. Stop doing that. Uh, But that's where I was. And I was going to the gym every day, um, working out. I felt great. I really felt like I had control of things for the first time in a long time and things were really good. Um, I walked down the aisle, 40 pounds lighter. It felt really good. Um, you get through that like post wedding haze and, um, the gym was less of a priority, but I was still doing it, uh, just not as frequently. And, um, one day I was at the gym and my wireless headphones died and, um, What I didn't realize was there was two young men behind me who were filming me and making fun of me and calling me a whale. And I, it like shook me in a way, like I still, I don't know why that still bugs me, but it does. I mean, people on the internet have said way worse things. 
uh, it was something about the audacity of them doing it in person. Like, you were within earshot of me. I heard you. I looked you in the eye. Well, I went out to my car. I cried really hard. I never went back to the gym and I paid for it for like six more months before I even canceled. It was so dysfunctional and weird. Um, and uh, life went on. And uh, then I got sick. And I have um, psoriatic arthritis. And that is an autoimmune disorder that affects my joints. Um, and it had gotten to a place where um, I was, I met with a specialist who said that um, I may not walk in five years. So that was terrifying. Mm. Um, I was in the worst shape of my life. In the subsequent years, I gained um, all of the weight I had lost plus, you know, 20% because that's how that goes. Like that's the, that's the standard. <laughs> and um I was tipping the scales at roughly 360 pounds and I felt horrible 100% of the time. And um, it was just miserable. And I was in constant pain, uh, which I had grown to believe was normal. And like, I'd really, I'm, I'm one who like quickly normalizes things. And it's, it's an odd trait. I like just sunk into the pain and was like, oh, okay. So I'm going to hurt for forever now. Awesome. And, um, but there I was with this, like, I started, you know, Googling and like death scrolling through um, images of people with psoriatic arthritis. And I ended up in a corner of like young people like teenagers in wheelchairs and I'm like well that's gonna be me I'm gonna be in a wheelchair this is gonna be horrible and I like could not accept that like that was the thing that it couldn't sit comfortably and I had let so many other things just sort of sit and that made me so deeply uncomfortable so I reached out to my friend Ray Ray is an amazing personal trainer and a motivational speaker. He is one of the kindest, coolest humans on planet Earth. Um, and I said, Ray, I'm in trouble. Um, this is what's going on with me. I've done a whole bunch of research and there is some like peripheral research that says that a psoriatic arthritis there is a percentage of patients with psoriatic arthritis who really benefit from weightlifting. Uh, the theory is that when you have um, basic muscle strength in those core muscles, in your hips, in your glutes, um, any of the muscular uh, structure that wraps around your joints, that supporting those joints with really strong muscles, well defined musculature, will then take some of the um, pressure off of the joints and ultimately lead to less deterioration. Because ultimately what's happening in psoriatic arthritis is you're losing, um, you're basically losing all the cartilage um, and they, you end up with what they call a pencil in a teacup. So literally your bone will sit in your joint and look like a pencil in a teacup. And it's horrifying. That's the point at which your body can't support yourself. Those, those joints no longer work. So um, in an attempt to not have to go on really heavy um, immunosuppressant drugs and biologics, which was what I was facing as like the first line of defense and this idea that like, that's it, and it doesn't work well, <laughs> basically was, was, was what I was looking at. I was like, okay, I can, I can work out. Like, I know I can do that. Like, let's see if we can't build these muscles. And reached out to a friend, explained tearfully what was going on. He was scared for me, but not available. <laughs> um, 
it had happened that he had just started working with a football team and he his schedule just didn't allow for another client especially um somebody who needed as much attention as i was gonna need right and so he introduced me to lucas and lucas trumbull changed my life <laughs> um in Lucas, not only did I find an incredible trainer who is smart and really, really well educated, um, not uh, not your average front of the mill. I'm a personal trainer because I took a class on the internet. Personal trainer. He's um, he has a degree in exercise physiology. He is super smart and totally a nerd about this stuff. <laughs> um, but I also found a person who was willing from day one to listen to me and to hear the words, my goals are not aesthetic. I don't care about what I look like. I just need to maintain my mobility. I want to stop hurting and I'd like to just live my life. And he heard that. And that is also incredibly rare because unfortunately this industry is deeply aesthetically focused. Lucas and I started with the bare basics. He is obsessed with really basic movement and the function and form of that. And that's where it began. And we spent a year working out together. It started two days a week and then it grew to three days a week. And then it was four days a week. And now for the last year plus, it's been five days a week. Um, and it started simple because I was in terrible shape and I was in so much pain. But we got about eight weeks in and I didn't hurt anymore. That's amazing. Right. And That's so amazing. I knew something was changing. And while weight didn't melt off of me rapidly because it's not what we were doing, um, my whole body began to change. Right. And the next thing I knew, I was doing things that I didn't think were even possible at all. And I also like little things like I, for years, had claimed to be profoundly clumsy. I wasn't clumsy all of the falling, the like comic quantity of falling, the constant bruises from all of the tripping and falling and banging into things, all of that ended because I wasn't clumsy. I was weak and unbalanced. That is so interesting. I've never thought about that. Um, that actually just like I think the fact that you started seeing results and more importantly, feeling results of a lack of pain in just eight weeks speaks to like the testament of building muscle. Like I've learned so yeah. much from this season, talking to coaches of just like how important muscle really is and, and building it. Like, as you started out, like what was Lucas telling you? The first thing Luke said to me was, um, we're going to learn to squat. And I said, why? Because <laughs> <laughs> I am, I am a little contrary sometimes in this scenario, in the beginning, I was super contrary. Like I didn't want to be there. I felt miserable. This was stupid. Why are we doing this all the time, all the time? Why are we doing this? And he looked at me and he said, the leading reason that people end up in nursing homes when they're old is because they can't get on and off the toilet on their own. That is a squat, y'all. Yeah. Hinge those hips, bend those knees. End of story. He's like, everyone should squat every day as much as they can. That's how you maintain independence. He's like, those are the muscles that you need to work so that you'll be okay. And I'm like, what? That's amazing. Like, that's insane. I didn't think of that at all. So it started there. It started with like tons of squats. And early on, it was body weight box squats. You know, I was barely squatting. Um, 
and it was um it was lots of like really practical stuff just like carrying weight just like you know basic like farmer lift like you know just really like simple basic stuff and it started there and then it just grew progressively and it was all about increasing that mobility and strength and it it really did it was slow and steady and focused but it changed everything um we really didn't get into the lifting in any significant way in that first year like for an entire year it was just about learning like teaching my body to move the way that I would need to move when we started to actually really lift. Wow, that's crazy that you started out so small and maintained that little, little, little progress here and there for a full year before you like yeah. really got into it. Like he he saw early on that I would have the ability to move large quantities of weight. Um, one of the things that Luke has always done still to this day, I do not, I am unaware of how much I am lifting in the moment. He racks up weight, says, focus, deep breath, let's go. And that's it. So I am completely unaware of the progression. I pay no attention to it. Because he doesn't ever want me in my head. So, because it's not about that. I'm just doing the motion. Please just move your body this way. Let's go. It's a lot of that. And um, so, as a result, um, I am not at all conscious of it. I've only recently, it's only... It's only in the last probably six months. So it worked. We just last week was our two year fit anniversary. Luke and I have been doing this for two years now. Yay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and um, it, it's only in the last six months or so that I've become aware of just how much weight I actually lift. I was not aware that it was such a big deal. I, I remember a few months ago, um, doing just overhead presses and I'm just I'm just doing what I do and one of these very fit girls who trains who's a trainer at the gym uh that we used to go to um she walked in the room and she goes holy crap and I didn't hear it because I'm in like a trance when I'm lifting I don't hear anything but like I heard her go holy crap and I was like, I literally texted Luke and I said, did she, what did she say? And he goes, you were way out lifting her. And she was very surprised. And I was like, oh, I had no idea. That's awesome. That is so cool. I, I did, he's like, he's like, you're lifting more than any woman in that gym can lift. The, the scale is not a part of my process. Um, not for any other reason that it just then it just doesn't benefit me it isn't the focus and it doesn't benefit me um in any way so I get on a scale at my home when I want it is very occasional and it's sort of just like it literally just it's the way the wind blows my brain will go like huh wonder um and so we use uh photos and video to uh, sort of document change but the reality is like I know when my body's changing and while yes I'm down 86 pounds I also am down like six bra sizes and three pant sizes and an entire shoe size I want to ask like now that you have all of this knowledge about weightlifting. I'm sure you're still learning things every day, yep. but you like started out from zero and now you're here outlifting people in their own gym. Um, what is like 
something you'd say to someone or a piece of advice you'd give to someone who is interested in weightlifting, but maybe like intimidated by it or doesn't have their own lupus yet or something like that. Um, what would you say to someone like that? So Luke and I would both tell you, a, you got to start somewhere. We all start somewhere. We all have a journey by which we find our way to picking up things that are heavy. Um, cause that's all it is. It's all any of it is. So like, don't get in your head about it. Um, really it's just like, try start simple. You know, there's a reason that like on TikTok and Instagram, my progressions almost always start with an empty bar. It's because I want you to see that it starts there, but you will always find someone at the gym who is willing to show you how to do it right. And then start light, get to a place where you're comfortable. So just work with the bar. I worked with just the bar for a really long time until I got comfortable. And even recently when we shifted to a different gym um, that didn't have the exact same equipment, I'm very comfortable with a certain set of, um, of uh, like bars and I don't have those right now. Um, I am a lover of a trap bar and a lover of the cambered bar. And I don't have either of those. I'm working straight bar every day until we're in our new gym. And as a result, I had to like relearn some stuff, but like start with the empty bar. You can figure that out. And then how, how heavy is the bar again? Remind me. Roughly, so they they run between 45 and 65 pounds are the, the industry standards. It's usually okay. I or 65 and the thinner the bar the the lower the weight so like if it's a thinner bar you know that you're dealing in 45 and not 65 oh my gosh I can't even imagine lifting 45 pounds right now like that's crazy of course you can pick up 45 pounds and put it over your head 45 pounds is not that much weight I don't believe you no I'm gonna try it I never, I don't really go to a gym anymore. I'm like a work out from home person now because of the pandemic. Right. I have like dumbbells at home. Yep. Um, but I'm going to have to go to a gym just to try that because you I can't it. picture it for myself. Kids. You can pick up your friend's kids. So you can pick up that bar. Like that's, that's sort of how I think about it. Like, it's just not that much weight. It'll be fine. Um, you know, and then the internet's such a good resource get online, look at things. And again, it's about those, it's about getting those movements right first. It's about learning how to push your hips back and hinge those hips properly. It's about bending your knees properly. But those are all really simple movements that once you've got them, so many things are easily done. That's great advice. Um, And so if you could like take this advice and sort of step back for a second and think about like super high level, not just weightlifting, like getting started in general on any health journey for someone who just needs to get started, just needs like a little motivation or they're about to get started and they don't know what to do. And you could say one thing to them about this whole thing overall. What do you think that would be? You've got this. You are worth the time and effort. And at the end of the day, self-care is fitness. Taking care of yourself is so vital. And just like, listen, it doesn't have to start big. Go for a walk. Walk for 10 minutes. See how it makes you feel. Take some time and be present in that, you know, little steps. We always, always say small changes make big change happen. And so make those small adjustments in your life. Take that 10 minutes to go for a walk, get in the pool and swim or walk. I walk in the pool a lot recently. Little things make all the difference. So make an effort towards those little changes 
because you're worth it and you deserve to have all of the things that you want in life. And at a bare minimum, you should be happy, healthy, and comfortable. Um, that is amazing advice. I'm going to like print that out on a poster for my room. <laughs> So the thing uh, we always say, the thing that we implore our audience, because Lucas and I have grown to be um, the company that is Fat Girl Fit. We're partners now. It's not just a, a trainer right. relationship. We actually work out in tandem now, um, as opposed to training separately. Um, the thing that we always want to tell people, like our little thing is do something kind for yourself. That is all we're asking. Do something kind for yourself. You deserve it. You do deserve it. And speaking of deserving things, so you mentioned again um, that like self-love is self-care. And yes. you told me that you have now figured out how to like stop feeling selfish when you go to the gym and like work to take care of yourself. So yeah. how do you practice like keeping that a priority? And what are some of the things you do? Like when you're at the gym, like you mentioned, like you're in your headspace, um, yeah. to really make it feel like it's you time for the time that you're there. So I schedule the gym. I schedule the gym. Like I would schedule an appointment with anyone else. I treat it like it's not for me. Um, and by doing that, I eliminate an out. Um, I also have created a gym community. So I have friends who expect to see me and to whom I'm accountable because we see each other. Now, of course, Lucas and I see each other every single day at the gym. And, and by doing that, like that's by design so that we are sure that we're both there. Listen, he'll always be there. He can't help himself. He's a freak and he loves it. I, on the other hand, don't love it. There's a part of me that still does not. Um, so I'm not saying that like, this is, uh, you know, I, I don't, there's, the, I think that that's a myth that like, we all eventually fall in love and become addicted to the gym. Not the case. I don't love it. It is an act of self-love every time I decide to go and do it. It requires that I make that decision every day, but I give myself no out. Um, the other thing that I really do is I, I do feel terrible when I don't work out. Like I'm about to do some traveling um, and like know that like I may not have gym access for a few days and like I know that on the back end of that I'm going to feel like garbage because my body is used to it and it wants it so I think you schedule it I also am a real advocate of going to the gym at the same time every time you go so find a time that works schedule that time and make it consistent. Not only does that make it easier to schedule because I block out a specific time of the day that everyone in my life now knows is my time and mine alone. And you just don't, you don't get that time. But also what it also serves to do when you go consistently at the same time every day or however many days a week you go, it serves to create a community because you'll see the same people at the gym over and over and over again. And so long as you are open and willing, you will then meet those people at the gym um, and then create your own community there. And so many people struggle in that, in finding a fitness community. And I can't say enough how valuable I find that. About nine months ago, um, yeah, about nine months ago, I, all of a sudden, this cute, young, 20, 21 year old trainer, this little Gen X kid was showing up at the gym with all of his little, I used to call them gym bunnies, his little, his, his 
these little kids, they were kids and they were invading my time and my space. And I was like, do they not know this is my gym from 1.30 to 3? And I was so put off initially. And then they didn't go away. And they were there more and more. And it was every day. And so finally, I made a joke. And I was like, you know, because it was like a group of like 20 to 25 year old, like shirtless boys. And I was like, oh, don't worry, boys, I'm here. Try to keep up. And <laughs> by making a joke, I broke the ice and no longer all of the things I was feeling were just in my head. And as a result of like past experience. Um, and those guys ended up being like, they're my gym crew and they're in some of my most popular TikTok videos with their shirts off, uh, giving me all the love because they're so stoked at what I'm doing and, um, so excited to be a part of that. So like make an effort. I know that it feels hard but find the time, schedule the time, make it a priority that's not easy to get out of, and then try to create a community. And if you can take those steps, then if you're going to work out in a gym, it's going to be the best possible experience if you make that all work on, you know, for you. You know, I also recommend finding a trainer if that's within your budget, but find a trainer that will work with you on non-aesthetic goals if that's where you're at. And if it's about working out at home for you, that is an awesome opportunity. You can use um, the internet. You can use programs like Way Better and all of their challenges. There are lots of ways to exercise and um, and practice self-love and self-care through physical fitness. Right. Right. And the, um, and that's a nice thing too. Like if people do opt to work out from home, like way better and the general internet, you can find your yes. community on the internet as well. If you don't have like yeah. cool 21 year old boys, were they the ones like giving you the, um, the fan in the, in that TikTok you made? I loved that so much. It was really funny. They are, those are my boys. I love them. Like, like they're my brother. I just love that. They just warm my heart. Um, well, yeah. here, I think like, I just think that you're someone who anyone would want to like hang out with in a life or workout setting. And like, you have so much wisdom to share and you've learned so much through your own journey. And you're now just like sharing it with everyone, whether it be like your new gym friends or people on TikTok. So now I have to ask the question for you, like if you could look back to the very beginning for yourself and hmm. say one thing to your past self what do you think that would be be kind to yourself yeah yeah because that's where it starts yeah if you can just be kind to yourself everything else will grow through that yeah I every single day I put my body on the internet in hopes that my 13 year old self sitting in a Weight Watchers meeting feeling horrible will find that woman. That woman who is on the internet saying, love yourself. It doesn't matter how much space you take up in the world. Look at me. I'm fat and I'm smart and I'm beautiful and I'm strong. And I have got it together because I have decided to make myself a priority. And yeah, that is really what this part of this journey, me putting this out there is about. So yeah, be kind to yourself. That's beautiful advice, especially since, you know, these journeys never go how we think they're going to go. They're not linear. There's a lot of ups and downs. Oh. And so you really do have to start with the kindness and then hold it in as you keep going, because 
yeah. you know, you talk about this all the time. There's going to be days where you just feel terrible and you're down on yourself and those voices creep yeah. back in. And so, um, yeah, keeping the, the kindness, I think is such a great thing to say to your past self and, and your present self really. That's yeah. I can't do anything more important. If, if I do nothing else every day, if I can just hold fast to those words, be kind to yourself and then practice that, then everything else will be all right. We're going to practice kindness. Like we're going to practice squatting. <laughs> yes. Squats and self-love y'all. <laughs> Squats and self-love. It's the title of this episode. <laughs> Uh, well, Tara, this was so fun. I have a little rapid round for you and then you are free to go. I definitely don't want to encroach on your gym time. Um, so first question is, and I feel like you might've already answered this, but we'll go back. What is one myth about health that you used to believe was true? I used to believe that you could tell someone's health by the size of their body. And that's nonsense. That is a very good one. Um, okay. Second question is what is your favorite weightlifting move and why? Ooh, I love me a deadlift, especially with a trap bar. And I love it because it makes me feel so strong and in so much control. You're the queen of the deadlifts. <laughs> uh, <laughs> All right. And last one, a little, would you rather wellness edition? I feel like I'm going to know your answer. Um, so when you're like having an off day and you need to like, like pep yourself back up, would you rather do a dance video or say one positive thing about yourself? Oh, I'm going to say something positive about myself. I, um, tried to not dance on the internet. <laughs> I try to avoid it. It's pretty awful. <laughs> <laughs> dance parties at home where no one can see that's uh that's yes, the 2021 right. in public dance parties in private <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh that's amazing well Tara like I said this was so fun I have like loved talking to you and learning your story and you've given me so much wisdom just in this like hour that we've talked so thank you again I will let you go and I'm sure I'll see you in a way better challenge probably really soon. Yeah, we've got one coming up and thank you so much for the opportunity. I truly appreciate it. Thanks for letting me, um, spread this, uh, the, the gospel of self-love and, you know, do something kind for yourself today. <laughs>